It was 36 years ago when this vessel slipped gently into the waters of Bonavista Bay. There probably wasn't much fuss nor excitement. She was just another schooner. There were hundreds of them all around the coast, solid, sturdy vessels designed for fishing north on the Labrador. Floaters, they were called. The fishermen would live aboard and fish from skiffs, split the fish on deck, and salt it down in the hold. And now the willing lass is the last of this breed. Her sails may be gone, her spars cut back, and her stern squared, for a succession of owners have tried to modernize the old girl. But the hull of the willing lass is still schooner, and so is her heart. She continues to head north in the spring, keeping alive an old tradition. And this is her destination, Belle Isle. North of Newfoundland's northernmost tip, this island has long been a landmark to crews headed to and from their fishing stations on the Labrador. Few would stop here. In fact, most sailors shun this place. There are no harbors. The currents and tides are savage. The winds funnel down the cliffs. There are no trees on its barren surface. In fact, they say not even bay couples will grow on Belle Isle. It's ringed with menacing cliffs, and in some of the gulches, patches of snow linger all summer. When the weather is fine, you can land a boat here by the northeastern lighthouse. Black Joe, they call it now, but the original name was Black Joke. A hint, perhaps, of something that happened here years ago. Belle Isle is a place rich in stories and legends, for fishermen have always been lured to its shores. Vikings and Basques, the Portuguese and the French, all knew Belle Isle and feared and respected it. It was known to the early navigators as the Isle of Demons and as the Isle of Bad Fortune. Harold, what place is this? Uh, this is a White Irish Trap for a day. In Red Cove, eh? In Red Cove, yeah. It's a pretty windy spot, isn't it? Oh, geez, yes, you get some awful squalls out of there sometimes. <laughs> Why is that? I suppose the hills are so high, is it? There's a valley coming down through in there, and, and the, the wind builds up on the island. This you get the squalls out through. It's a pretty uh, wild place, isn't it, Belle Isle? Pretty rough shore. Well, it is lots of times. We've had it very good this summer, no sea at all, which is exceptional. But, uh, this is not your best berth here, though, is it? No, our best berth is on the west end, yeah. southwest end. Is it always good now in Belle Isle, Harold, since you've been coming here? Have you always made a voyage of fish out of it? Uh, yes. Uh, last year wasn't as good. The year before it was real good. The other three years now, since I've been here lately, has been, uh, it's been good. Good voyage. You gotta suffer a bit for it. But, uh, yes, you gotta work hard. It's not the easiest place to haul a trap sometimes. No, but you get a lot of lap here, you see, in the streets. Lap and tide. Scattered iceberg. Yeah. Have you ever had it uh, where you had to move out of, out of uh, Lark Tickle there, though? Uh, once or twice in the fall, not, not in the summer. A lot of people seem to be a bit scared of Belle Isle because there's no. There's very few places you can harbor there, isn't there? Well, there's actually no harbor, but Lark Tickle is uh, 
In the summer, it's not that bad. The only thing is, uh, that is bad there is a sudden northeaster, eastern or northeast. You've got no shelter at all, so you just got to take it. <laughs> it's not good sometimes. I've lost a couple of trap boats in the last three years. That was in the fall. Is that why there aren't too many fishermen out here now, the past few years? Uh, I'd say that's some of the reason, Doug, uh, Dave, yes. But now you were telling me earlier, years ago, there were a lot of a lot of schooners here. There was an average of about 15, 20. Scattered time. I saw 42 there once, but uh, that was when fish was slack on the ladder. And now you're you're the last of them. The last of the schooners here, the last of that breed. So me and the willing last of two it up, I think. <laughs> well, it promised to be an interesting assignment to record on film the story of the willing lass, the last of the floaters, and to learn from Harold Parsons and the crew of the willing lass about this wild, lonely, unpredictable island. As it turned out, though, it was not the sudden winds and tides and icebergs we had to fear. It was another and far more terrifying demon the island would unleash. Fire. It struck the reliable one, the longliner we were staying aboard. The fire had started in the engine room. Smoke was belching through the ventilation stack and seeping out through the seams on the side of the vessel. Skipper Isaac Rose and crewman Albert Hill had twice tried to go below to put out the flames, but were forced back by smoke and fumes. The reliable one had to be cut loose. There was danger of fire spreading to the willing less. There was danger of the gasoline and diesel fuel exploding. Some expected her to blow at any minute. It wasn't long before flames began licking out. Isaac's longliner was doomed. We watched, horrified, helpless. It was a terrible sight. It was a terrible moment for all of us, but especially for Isaac Rose. Isaac had owned the Reliable One for 18 years. Till now, she'd lived up to her name. She'd served him well. He'd treated her well. He'd put everything he had on her, completely rebuilt the superstructure, and had just fitted out for the mackerel fishery. And now he had to watch as his boat, as his livelihood, went up in smoke. The vessel drifted out into the strong current of the Strait of Belle Isle. One by one, the boats turned away. watched till the reliable one was nothing but an inky smudge on the horizon. Next problem, to get the crew of the reliable one and the land and sea crew back home. For we too had nothing left. Most of our film and equipment and all of our personal belongings had been on board. It's a long steam from Belle Isle back to Newfoundland. The longliners at Lark Tickle were into a lot of fish. Yet there was no hesitation. They gave up valuable fishing time to get us back home. Norm Cull tried to take us in, but his small longliner was forced back to Belle Isle by heavy seas. Later that evening, when the winds and tide rips subsided a bit, we made it back to Carpoon with Glenn Penny on his longliner, Penny's Dream. All the way in, our thoughts were on the fire. 
We were sickened and saddened by what had happened. Glad the fire hadn't started in the middle of the streets. We wondered if we'd ever get back to complete the story of the Willing Lass and of Belle Isle, the Isle of Demons. It was about two weeks later before we were able to muster our resources and return to Belle Isle. Not much had changed. The fish were still plentiful, especially here at White Point Cove. This is a good berth, but it's not always easy to haul. There's often a good lop out here on the point, and the tide is strong. Harold Parsons and his crew must wait sometimes for hours for the wind and tide to ease. It's usually worth the wait, though, for the fish seem to like this spot. It's the most reliable berth they have here in Belle Isle. <laughs> White Point Cove has given them some good hauls of fish. 15 to 20 kentles were common last summer. That's not bad, for directly to the south, northern peninsula fishermen had a complete failure. Their traps were empty. But it seldom fails here at Belle Isle. The island is like a big ship moored in the North Atlantic. Finally, home they go. It's a long steam back to the Willing Lass. The winds can freshen quickly here, as we'd already learned, and there's no real shelter under the cliffs. It's not a place for the faint of heart. Once, Harold and his crew had to throw fish overboard to lighten the load. Then there are the times, though, when the demons slumber and Belle Isle becomes a quiet place and the willing lass a peaceful home nestled under the cliffs of Lark Tickle. Tell me about the willing lass. Uh, how old is she and where does she come from? She's 35 years old now. Uh, that's the bottom part, and well, most of her except the repairs. Uh, she was built in uh, Somerville, Bondus Bay. Uh, and she went through a few few people, ended up with me. This bottom is still as good as ever. With a little, little repairs and uh, it's a lot of upkeep, a lot of expense. If you can make it, I'd rather have that one than a smaller one. The skiff comes home to the schooner. The fish are pronged aboard. This is the way it was done in our father's and grandfather's time, when salt fish was king. When practically every harbor on the northeast coast sent crews north for the summer fishery. Long hours at the trap and putting away the fish, returns were often low. For as the song says, fish was low and flour was high. Still, it was a living and a way of life for countless thousands of our people. Being aboard the Willing Lass was like stepping back in time. In the early days, a woman often sailed north as cook, and the old tradition hasn't died on the Willing Lass. <laughs> Helen Butt is the cook, and a good one too, despite the teasing. But don't worry about Helen. She can give it as well as she can take. No one but bloody fool. How come you never pick the bones up a cook? I picked the bones. Don't. 
After the hot meal is back at it again, there's a deck full of fish to be put away. It's all split, of course. A cutthroat, a header, and two splitters. Tony King heads and Pat Boyd cuts throats. Bob Payne is an old hand at splitting. It's the first time for Brian Squires. George White salts away the fish in the hold, sprinkling just the right amount of salt. Every fish they catch passes through his hands. Day by day, the pile grows higher and higher. Day by day, the willing lass sinks lower and lower in the waters of Lark Tickle. But Harold, why did you decide now on, on, on a schooner? I mean, that was, that's the old, this is the old fashioned way to fish, isn't it? Well, it is, Joe, and that's what I was used to before. I'd rather fish that way after fish, and uh, fortunately there have been in the last six years. Very good this year so far. Why did you pick Belle Isle now as, as uh, the place to go? <laughs> it doesn't matter the devil, devil you know it is. You're used to and uh, It's a bit rougher fishing here, but uh, you can usually make a saving voyage. Never failed completely yet. Didn't it? You've always done well here, then. Fair. Last year was a poor year, but uh, the year before was real good. Mm -hmm. well, Harold, there's, there's a lot of work to salt fish, and uh, the way you're fishing now must be must be hard to get men to go with you sometimes, is it? Uh, not too, not too hard. <laughs> On the first of it, the fellow's getting back used to, or not used to, old type trap fishery. But this past five years, there's been no problem with crew. You've got a pretty young crew this year. Yeah, most of them are young. But they're good, good workers. It's up early in the morning. Can take it. Good nice and much better than that. It's a pretty long day you punch in too, usually, isn't it? Yeah, usually from four. We worked around, I think, once this year around the block. Usually four. Now it's a darker morning, about five. Get up. Sometimes leave five. Sometimes a little after. Do you usually have the weighing less? Full of fish when you go home? No, it was only one year we had her just about uh, full. See, we're a small crew, the Scunners, uh, that one when it was built to carry two crews, 11 men, two boats and tables. And, oh, 100 a man years ago was considered a very good voyage for summer. We had 250 a man here before last. Last year wasn't that good, it we went well over 100. The Willing Lass did fair this year, just under a thousand kentles. And they sold a fair amount of fresh fish over the side to a Portuguese trawler that anchored for a while at Belle Isle. Not a bad voyage. Few would fish this way anymore though, even if the schooners were available. Most of the longliner fishermen prefer to sell fresh. Splitting and salting means a lot of work and cuts into fishing time. Yet the schooner has a distinct advantage out here. There's no need to rush to port every few days to unload your catch. And the schooner is big and comfortable too, a home away from home. Helen was born in Tizard's Harbor, but now calls Mary's Harbor Labrador home. A widow, she's worked hard all her life and has spent several years fishing herself. I wondered how she came to be cook on the Willing Lass. Yeah, I went to Springdale and uh, so I went to uh, Skipper, Carl Parsons, and I asked if they needed anybody on the Willing Lass. And apparently, as far as he knew, he had his crew. So I said to him, I said, if, uh, if anybody backs out, think on me. So the next morning I left, drove down to St. Anthony, and when I got in St. Anthony, I had called that I had to come back. So he had a job for me. Do you like it out here? Oh, I do, I love it. 
It's supposed to be a pretty rough and rugged spot. I, I, I know there are not many women out here for sure. Right. You don't mind it? No, I don't mind. No. I guess we're going to get the good days and we're going to get the bad ones. That goes with it. I suppose you spend a good bit of time alone, though, on the vessel, don't you, when the men are away fishing? That's right. I spend uh, quite a few hours here sometimes when they're gone to all the trap. Probably they might go for a couple hours. Well, it takes them at least two, two and a half hours if they haven't got any problem. Sometimes there's a big toy on, probably gone five, six hours. Do you ever get concerned about them when the wind comes up? Well, I do, yes. But I know Skipper knows this place pretty good, so I guess he know a lot more about it than I do. You get along pretty well with the crew, do you? Oh, yes. Great crow, great skipper. Great cook. <laughs> Thanks. It's a moody, dramatic place, this Belle Isle. A place of swirling winds and powerful tides. It's not an easy place to fish, yet for those who dare, it seldom fails. Once there were many schooners here, today there's only one. In fact, as far as we know, the willing lass is the last of her breed, still fishing anywhere in this province. Skipper Sam Humby, who built her, must be proud. So must Skipper Harold Parsons. At the age of 17, he cleared customs and sailed the schooner north to these waters. And now, after years in business, he's returned to the sea and the life of a northern fisherman. The willing lass is his. She's the last survivor of a colorful era in our history. Well, I suppose I've done that, nice. but I don't want her to get. Well, you want more than that, put her down. She's nice. Dirty son of a gun, after all. I'm not showing her that. If anybody wakes up for her, I don't know. Huh? And so the days pass on Belle Isle. Long, hard hours of work, moments of laughter, hauling the traps, splitting and salting, watching the weather, hoping for a good voyage. Often the willing lass is lit up at night, for sometimes there's a lot of fish and it must be put away. Once last summer, they worked round the clock. The fishery is short, just over two months, and you've got to keep at it while the fish are running. Years ago, this would be a familiar sight on Belle Isle and all along the French shore and the Labrador coast. For generations, the vessels from our northern bays fished here. Before that, the French fished Belle Isle, apparently in great numbers. 80 to 90,000 kentles a year came from Belle Isle in the early 1800s. A far cry from today's production. This then is the end of a long chapter in our history. A schooner, the willing lass, fishing on Belle Isle. And a man named Harold Parsons, who gave up an easier life to return to his first love, the sea. Do you, you, have, you never really regretted getting away from city life and the business world? No, no way. It keeps you away from home in the summer, which is the best time of the year. But, uh... Apart from that, I'd rather be here than shore, especially if I had to sit in the office or something, which I had to spend a few years at and working in stores. There's no comparison with the outdoor life. So the willing lass has been kind to you? Oh, yeah. Yeah, it's been good, man. I've enjoyed it. Bad is good. Most of it's good. <laughs> Are you partly in this now because you're interested in vessels like this and, and you like to see it preserved? I guess it's probably in the blood. The first two schooners I had was uh, sailing schooners with some power. 
And uh, I guess I got in the blood and then never got out. Father was fishing before, and grandfather's. And I started off the same way on the first one. 